Yeah, g'day. I like lathes. I already had two of them. Yeah, including this nice old German bolly from the like early 70s or so. One of those little Chinese mini lathes, which I guess everyone's got. Although this one's been modified a wee bit. But I still decided to get a third one. So I bought the cheapest Schaublin 125 CNC available in Europe. Since I've been pulling it down to clean out 40 years of cake dawn, hardened, uh, varnishing, coolant and lubricant, and also to convert it to a more modern Linux CNC based uh, controller, people have been asking me what was my system to keep track of all of the parts I'm removing from it and to keep it all, you know, nicely sorted. This channel's number one fan, Nico, offered this summary. And for those who ask, I'm glad you did, because as you can see, it's a gravity-based system which I use. So basically each time I take a component off the machine, I dump it down on the nearest flat surface, and if it doesn't roll away, well, that's obviously where it was meant to go, isn't it? This is all the electrical stuff I pulled out of the electrical cabinet. The Shoblin's coolant tank is right in the middle of the floor, kind of in the way. I figure if that cross-pollinates with the Maho coolant system, then I could have a new form of uh, Marmite. Yeah, and of course all the mechanical parts are sort of scattered across any horizontal surface I can find at the moment, which is really not ideal. All the smaller hardware I've just kind of bagged up. Some of I didn't bother putting a name on it because it's pretty obvious, like this is just all the waste scrapers. Some parts I just mark directly. But all the other things I do try and put a name on where they came from. But yeah. And there's my Gibbs and stuff, just all dumped in a box. And then all the miscellaneous stuff, which probably isn't going back on, just gets dumped in an ice cream container. I'll probably use some of this to mount hardware in the new control cabinet. At the moment the old computer from the Shoblin is just like right in the way, taking up space on the floor. With some of it lurking under the 3D printer's table. My furnace room here has got the old control cabinet cover. It's also got the old control cabinets lurking in here as well, waiting to be chopped up into a bunch of little pieces and then glued back together. The biggest bit's still in front of the garage door. All the rest of the Shelblin's panel works out here in the back in the wood shop. I guess you could also call the wood shop incoming parts receiving at this time. So I've already got a safety relay, got one of these little keyboards that's going to get somehow integrated into the new controller, some marking for cables, a bunch of switches, or two switch blocks, yeah. My welding bench is being used for parts cleaning and inspection. And if I run out of space, I can still dump stuff on the floor. In my last video I was talking about how I was a bit concerned about getting this nut off, the x axis ball screw, because I didn't have a wrenching flat. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, in that video, a bunch of people noticed straight away that the other end of the shaft actually has an Allen key slot. Perfect. Thanks for your spotting, guys. I think I'll just back up the Allen key into the vise that it can't wobble around. Uh, there we go. Excellent. One of my mates from the aviation industry saw my video where I was using a razor blade to take off this uh, kind of hardened coolant and a bit of rust and stuff. He was pretty horrified because the aviation industries had a big problem with uh, scribe lines. When painters go along to paint an aircraft and they cut off old sealant or cut off the masking tape to make lines and stuff and run along it with a Stanley knife or box cutter, one of those sort of things, putting scratches right along the length of the fuselage. Aluminium is extremely notch sensitive, so that sort of thing causes massive structural problems. 
and even scraps some aircraft. But this isn't an aircraft, and this is cast iron, so it should be fine. When I worked for the airline, we had a Canada Regional jet, which had been delivered new, and at the first major check, we found scribe lines at the bulkhead above the wing, you know, sort of the, the floor bulkhead. Massive amount of work to get the, get the repair installed in that location. If this is an aircraft, don't use a blade. A lot of people think that the Aloha Airlines Light 243, you know, the one where the top of the plane blew off, or a lot of people think of that as being a scribe line accident, but actually it wasn't. I looked up the NTSB report. Yeah, that one was more caused by the very thin skins used in that location being cut, countersunk, instead of dimpled. The extremely high cycle operation done by Aloha Airlines, uh, compounded by severe corrosion environment, of course. Poor maintenance inspection practices. And I think there was also some issues with the debonding of the, the bonded lap joint, kind of taking away the aircraft's fail-safe protection. I must say I'm pretty happy about this T-slot being installed on the cross slide because this will be a place I'm going to use to mount cameras when I'm filming. These switches need to come off. This is the collet release and the second one's the emergency stop. And they're going to have to come out to be able to get the machine through the door. I wonder what that sticker means. There's also another sticker on the other side. It says abort. Pretty nice eye for detail here. The springs and mushrooms to pre-tension those pedals are pretty nicely made. The pivot blocks on the pedals are also really nicely done. Now with that big ship, the Ever Given, stuck across the Suez Canal, I wonder what we're going to run out of next week in Europe. I mean obviously petrol prices are going to go up, but I'm sure there's going to be something that we, no one's thought about that's essential to the supply chain, which is on that boat, or on one of the other boats that's stuck waiting to go down the canal. So, yep, watch the space, huh? Clean off this part as well since it's easily exposed now and with, with the machine up on the pallet it's a bit higher to work.
This is a pretty cool feature I've seen on a few of their castings. They use one of those Dymo letter creators, stuck that on the, on the mold, and then f formed it. That's a beautiful casting, the way it's picked up all of the detail from the Dymo lettering. like I have to remove the collet draw tube. This is the draw tube. It's got an O-ring in the middle. There's a wee bit of light surface rust or gunge down on the, down on the nut end. So the collet pull and threads look in a really nice condition. The spindle in a taper is B32 collet native. Unfortunately, B32 collets aren't that common. They're really only used by Schaublin on these sort of models and the Emco V13. But I'll keep an eye out. I'm sure sooner or later a set will come up. They tend to go for a pretty high price, but oh well. I knew that getting into this. See the bits in the bottom of this casting? Kind of look a bit like mouse droppings. Up in here there's some more. Those are teeth that have come off the encoder drive belt. This one here, so that's a definite replacement. The encoder's a very nice Heidenhain unit. Oh no, I've just realized what it means that that belt's dead. It means the spindle's got to come out. Old iron. Kind of amazes me how small the actual headstock is of a Schaublin 125. Considering it's such a massive, you know, 1.2 ton machine, the actual headstock's really not that massive. This is the disconnect for the encoder. Very nice connector. Heidenhain always uses really high quality cables and shielding and connectors and stuff, so that's very typical. The encoder's in Heidenhain Rod 620. Man, it's got a beautiful big sort of flywheel pulley on it. Bit noisy. Wonder what the bearings are like. Seem to turn quite smoothly though. Well, I guess I'm doing pretty well, you know. This is the first sort of significant setback I've had in this project so far. Not terribly happy about having to pull the spindle. But I guess it does give me the opportunity to re-lubricate the spindle bearings. In the manual there's a procedure of how to re-lubricate re those bearings every five years. It's not terribly realistic, at least against modern practice, because it says to dissolve some Kluber grease in trichloroethylene or one of those nasty ozone depletants and then soak the bearings in it. And when you take the bearing out, the ozone depletant uh, obviously evaporates, leaving the bearing nicely lubricated. Well, that's not really an option anymore, is it? Not a lot I can do about it. Have to strip it down, have to pull the spindle out and replace this. When I first dragged it in, I stopped on the slope. There's a slope right up to about here in my garage. I'll drag this in onto the flat part, lift it up, put blocks under it and take this pallet away. I 
think it's time I took this lathe off this pallet because it can't go through the doorway on the white pallet. So let's get to it. The pitch between these adjustable height feet side to side is 52 centimeters, but my pallet jack is 53. So they're going to have to come off for now. And I guess I'll clean them up and put them back on at the very end of the project once the machine's ready to go into its final position. Well, there it is off the pallet, up on blocks on three points. I've got a nice clear runway down through here. As you can see, straight behind that door is the bandsaw, so that's going to have to be moved. But for now, I'm going to get this video cut and uploaded. Thanks a lot for watching. If you like this kind of content, give it a thumbs up, because then we can fill YouTube with a whole bunch of Shelblin CNC lathe content, which I guess everybody needs. And we'll see you again next time.